This is a case of a craniopharyngioma treated through an endoscopic endonasal approach. The 67-year-old man pre presented with progressive frontal headaches and intermittent blurred vision. His visual acuity showed decrease bilaterally uh, in visual acuity, but grossly full to confrontation. He had no evidence of overt pituitary dysfunction. He was not able to get an MRI, unfortunately, because of shrapnel uh, from Vietnam service. Here is preoperative CT scan, shows a cellar and supracellar lesion extending up toward the floor of the third ventricle, displacing the chiasm anteriorly. He did also have some challenging nasal anatomy of significant prominent nasal spur in the septum. Visual field testing showed an incomplete infratemporal quadrantinopsia on the right side and a mild one on the left. This was consistent with his OCT, which shows significant nasal thinning on the right eye. Here you see our setup in the operating room with a patient lying supine with his head slightly rotated toward the operating surgeons. Two screens, each ergonomically placed to be directly across from the two operating surgeons, ENT at the head of the bed and neurosurgery at the patient's side. Here you see the setup in a schematic with a scrub nurse below the two surgeons, image guidance at the head and anesthesia off to the left side. Neurophysiology is of course mandatory for these cases. Initial exposure consists of resection of a middle turbinate. Free graft would be used on the nasal septum at the end of surgery. A right-sided vascularized nasal septal flap is performed. Here you see the first inferior and now superior cut. The cut is made superiorly at the level of the middle turbinate, but then extends as high as possible anterior to this when we're anterior to the olfactory mucosa. Subperiosteal dissections are performed after the inferior and superior cuts are connected anteriorly, and then we dissect back to the sphenoid rostrum. Once the rostrum is identified, it can be removed with care syringure, creating a wide exposure to the sphenoid. The contralateral pedicle is sacrificed with suction cautery, and then the remainder of the exposure performed. Here you can see the very sharp nasal septal spur being dissected from the contralateral side. Right side of flap is chosen partly because of this spur. After wide sphenodotomy, the bone is carefully thinned and removed over the cella with a high speed drill and then care syringer only as a dissector. This is then extended across the superior cavernous sinus and the sphenoid limbus to remove the bone of the tuberculum and even the posterior planum. This is peeled in the anterior to posterior direction. Here we see brisk bleeding from the superior intercavernous sinus with removal. This is taken care of with just gentle surge of foam packing. Next, with irrigating tip on the high-speed drill, we carefully perform bilateral medial optic canal decompressions. This is an important step as the optic canal uh, is a limitation for lateral exposure. This also allows us to re remove the bone of the medial optic crowded recess. The superior cavernous sinus is then packed off, and then we can open across the superior cavernous sinus to see the top of the gland below, and we will see the chiasm coming into view above. This cruciate opening into the supracellar space is very limited and is directly centered essentially at the superior cavernous sinus. This gives us a beautiful view here of the supracellar space. Indocyan green fluorescence angiography under the endoscope shows the chiasmatic perforators. We take care to preserve these normal vessels when addressing the tumor. Here we can see the purplish tumor. You can see its involvement of, but separability from these subchiasmatic perforators. Again, taking a look with endocyan green, we can see some enhancement later on of the tumor. We can then enter in the tumor, again, navigating these infracellar chiasmatic perforators send a specimen to confirm diagnosis of craniopharyngioma. This is a mostly solid tumor at this point, and so using two suctions, we're able to enter the capsule of the tumor and gently suction it free. Once we debulk the tumor, microsurgical dissection using blunt and sharp dissection is performed. We're starting to see that the midline tissue, which was enhancing before, is intact pituitary stock. And this is pushed off toward the right side using rongeurs to send more specimen and two suctions to carefully debulk the tumor in the window between the chiasm and the gland. We're able to work 
around the side of the stock, preserving it and carefully delivering the internal contents of the tumor. You'll note there's no aggressive pulling of the tumor, merely dissection and allowing the tumor to deliver itself. Here we can see tumor capsule attachment and then bringing the endoscope into the supercellar space around the stock, we can see the posterior attachment, which appears to be on the posterior aspect of the stock right at the tuber scenarium. Here we can see that attachment, it's carefully peeled free, and then inspection posteriorly shows residual capsule. This will extend up onto the floor of the third ventricle as seen on the CT scan. Once the portion that is separable, easily separable, is dissected free, sharp dissection is used to transect the region where it contacts the hypothalamus. Care must be taken not just to pull tumor capsule from the hypothalamus as this could lead to hypothalamic injury. Instead, the endoscope is brought into the supercellar space and careful sharp dissection of this margin with the hypothalamus and the stalk is performed. Here we can see the last remnant coming up onto the floor of the third ventricle. This appears inseparable from the hypothalamus and appears to be merely thickened arachnoid capsule. Duragen collagen inlay is performed followed by nasal septal flap which covers this widely. This is covered with surgicel and tissue glue. A nasal Foley catheter is placed and the free mucosal graft from the middle turbinate is placed onto the nasal septum to aid in remucosalization. In addition to this, the Caicedo reverse flap could be used. Postoperatively, the patient only had brief polyuria, but had no evidence of pituitary insufficiency, including no diabetes insipidus. He had no change in visual fields on gross exam and no evidence of CSF leak. Postoperative CT scan immediately shows a complete resection with preservation of the stalk and decompression of the floor of the third ventricle. Here we see the post-operative six-month visual field exam with significant improvement in both visual fields as well as acuity. One year post-operatively, he's been followed with no evidence of recurrence and maintenance of his pituitary function.